Mind Over Magic is a colony sim management game where you're tasked with building a magical school while preventing the ever-present fog from engulfing everything that you have worked towards. In this video, we will talk about the first steps of the game and how you can set up your school for success. First, let's review the staff and students at your disposal. While there are significant differences between staff and students, the following elements impact both sets of units. Staff and students come in five different races. Humans, who have extra mana and one extra death save, we'll talk more about death saves in a bit. Vivified, who don't get any penalties or bonuses from eating, and they prefer to eat the lowest quality food available. They also have high HP. Wolfkin have high speed, and they'll eat wild rats. They also don't need a bed to sleep, although it's still a good idea to assign them a bed whenever possible. Later on then in the game, you'll unlock the Raven Colt. They have considerably high power, but they also have permanently lowered conviction. The Shattered have very low HP, but start the battle with armor. They're inorganic and are immune to certain debuffs. Let's look at the different menus that each unit has. We're going to start with status and conviction. This menu shows the selected unit's hunger, sleep, recreation, and learning meters. The learning meter is unique to students. If any of these meters gets low, the unit will suffer a Conviction debuff. So what is Conviction? Conviction is essentially the unit's mood. When it's high, they will perform well, and when it's low, bad things can happen. More on that later. The Conviction stat goes from 0 to 100, with 100 being the highest value and what you aim towards. The Conviction value changes gradually over time, so if you start at 60 Conviction and then get a minus 30 penalty, It'll take a bit before your conviction falls to 30. In this example, the staff member will lose two convictions per hour until their conviction hits 30, unless something changes. If conviction gets below 25, the unit has a chance to break. When a unit breaks, everything they do is out of your control. A few examples of breaks can be feeding frenzies, where the unit binge eats your food. At the time of writing this, you can actually mitigate this break by removing all the food permissions for that unit. They'll just wander about for a bit and then get a trauma, but at least your food will be safe. Just remember to re-enable their food options when they are not binging anymore. The next break that I've experienced has been a rampage, and this is where the unit goes around and destroys furniture or items on the ground. Last, we've got running away, and this is where the unit will just run out into the fog. To save them, you have to either complete a battle or wait until the timer expires. Speaking of traumas, let's talk about them. After a unit breaks, they will experience a trauma. Traumas are debuffs that can impact many aspects of the unit. They can reduce conviction, HP, and they can even cause death. Traumas last for 30 days and they can stack. Because of the stacking nature and the fact that each trauma can reduce conviction, the next trauma might be right around the corner. Traumas also reduce the unit's death save count by one. If they don't have any death saves left, they die. So my suggestion is that after a unit has a trauma, start thinking about replacing them. You might want to hire a new student that can use their element, or maybe you already have a student that um, is ready to uh, take over that mantle. Or if it is a student, maybe it's time to either graduate them or um, expel them. The next element of your staff and students are their trials and medallions. Starting staff have two medallions, and medallions are like traits, and they provide permanent buffs to the unit. Students don't start with any medallions. Instead, they have trials to complete, and trials are tasks that the student needs to complete in order to earn medallions. Students with a level one wand have three trials, level two wands have five, and level three wands have seven trials to complete. When you complete a trial, it will look kind of like a sun, and the student will acquire whatever medallion was indicated on that trial. In this example, the student destroys three objects. They'll gain a medallion that permanently buffs their power and their mana. The more medallions the student earns, the more scrolls you get when you graduate the student. The amount of scrolls you get from completing these trials is not that significant, so if you have a student that you plan on graduating and they have a difficult trial, it might be best to skip. We'll talk more about scrolls in an upcoming section. There's a lot of variety to the trials and medallions, so I suggest reviewing 
each individual trial that a student has and the rewards as soon as you recruit a new student. You can then figure out which trials you want to complete and what you need for the student to accomplish them. Since this is a game about magic, let's talk about the different elements and how they impact your mages. This detail can be seen on the Magic and Combat tab, which lists all the combat stats for each unit as well as their elemental spell levels. For combat stats, we have health, mana, power, speed, and death saves. Well, I guess death saves aren't really a combat stat, but they're important there too. So health is going to be how much damage a unit can take before being knocked out. And if the unit is ever knocked out, it will cause a trauma. With mana, every action that the unit takes costs mana. If they're building, they'll use mana. If they're researching, they'll use mana. When a user's mana is depleted, they'll go to the mana font to recharge. Mana lanterns can be used to recharge as well, but building those requires some research. Combat is a little bit different. It's turn-based, and each action has a set mana cost which is displayed. If the user runs out of mana during combat, they can pass their turn to recover 15 mana or use a mana potion. Power affects how much damage abilities do in combat. Speed affects combat order. Speed does not affect how quickly the unit moves in the overworld. Death saves show the amount of times a character can be traumatized before they die. If a unit runs out of death saves, they die. There are seven different elements in the game. Your units have the combat abilities only associated with their wand element. So if a lightning mage has two points in nature, they still are only able to use lightning abilities in combat. The max element levels of students who are still learning are displayed as potential. This student has one lightning, one earth, and one air, but when training is complete, they will have three lightning and two earth and two air. Let's go over the different elements in order of what I consider the most useful to the least useful. Now, I wanna preface this by saying that I'm talking about the early game specifically. In the mid and late game, every element has an opportunity to shine but in the early game, some are definitely better than others. So let's talk about what I consider to be the best element at the start of the game, and that is nature. So nature mages are excel at tasks including harvesting crops, chopping trees, making wands, and tending crops. These tasks you're going to be completing non-stop at the beginning of the game. Having a high nature skill will really help speed up that early game. In combat, nature mages support their allies by increasing their power. Overall, nature mages are best left off the battlefield in the early game. Their support options are great in the mid and late game, but not so much in the early game. So the next mage type that I think excels at the early game are earth mages. They're best at constructing and mining, two things that you're going to be doing a lot of at the start. One quick note about construction. This skill only applies to constructing buildings in the construction tab. Other buildings use the assembly skill. In combat, earth mages are the best tanks in the game. Always take an earth mage to the fight and put them on the front line. Next up we have lightning mages who excel at research and you need to complete about 10 different research nodes to have a sustainable base. In combat, lightning mages specialize in attacking an enemy on the field but their damage is a bit low compared to other elements. Fire mages are good at hunting rats and koa, as well as cooking. Cooking requires research to unlock, so I typically don't start with a fire mage and instead recruit a fire student early on and promote them to staff. In combat, fire mages deal great damage and can provide the useful retaliate buff to your front line. Air mages are great at assembling, which means they create the furnishings within your school. They're also good at hauling, but I haven't noticed a big difference between level 1 hauling and level 3. In combat, air mages have great damage and utility. I recommend taking a skilled air mage with you to any difficult fight. Dark mages are next on the list, and I would not suggest starting with a dark mage. The main task that dark is used for is quilting, but that requires arcane scrolls to research, and getting those requires combat. Consider hiring a dark mage after you've unlocked the quilted miner, which requires four dark to create but not until then. In combat, dark mages require setup to be useful. Even then, their damage is less than fire and air. The last element, and the one that I think you definitely should not start with, is water. Water is only used for two tasks, alchemy and cleaning. Neither of these tasks are impactful in the early game. 
Combat-wise, water mages make decent backline damage dealers. Now that we've gone over the different elements of your staff and students, let's get to some gameplay tips. Picking staff. So if you're playing on relaxed difficulty, you're going to start with three staff, while relentless starts with two. Both game modes also provide a ghost staff member when you first push the fog back. This ghost has one skill point in each element and doesn't require any sleep, so it works all day long. One thing that took me a moment to realize is how disposable your staff is. Well, not at first, but very early on in the game you'll be able to summon students. When students finish training, they can either be promoted to staff or graduate. Promoting a student to staff requires scrolls, which you get from graduating students and retiring staff. For the first staff members, I would suggest looking for a nature wand and an earth wand with two points in lightning or fire. Don't be too picky about the medallions that the staff members have. The wand element is much more important. But if you're looking for the perfect start, here are some medallions that I think might be good to start with. Increased conviction, faster teaching, and faster recreation are always good. If you've got an Earth Mage that has boosted HP, power, speed, or mana, even better. The first thing you're going to want to do when you start a game is start gathering resources to build a base. Wood and stone are the first resources that I would go for, along with gut berries. Use the wood and stone to build walls, doors, roofs, and floors to create rooms. Rooms are an important aspect of creating a thriving magical school. Without them, your staff and students will be miserable and have constant breaks. The rooms overlay, the default key there is F1, is pivotal to your success in Mind Over Magic. The overlay shows you what makes the room special. For example, the workshop increases research and crafting speed by 25%. Hovering over the workshop brings up the keyword and building requirements that need to be met for a room to be considered a workshop. Keywords are essentially special requirements that need to be met for room bonuses to function. Here's a quick breakdown of the different keywords used in creating special rooms. Elevated means that the room can have no adjacent rooms or foundation below. A room with grounded must be on foundation. At the beginning of the game, the only foundation is at the ground level just above the mana font. A towered room can have no adjacent room to the left, to the right, or above. You'll need to use stairs or ladders to get into this type of room. A skewed room has one outer wall that is at least three blocks taller than the other. Lofted means that the room needs to be taller than it is wide, and private means it needs only one point of entry. The last room type is isolated, which means it can have no path to another room. Some special rooms have other various requirements, including specific buildings that must be in the room and possibly a certain luxury value. Luxury is gained by adding fancy items to rooms. All items that provide luxury must be researched before they can be built, which means rooms requiring luxury are essentially locked until you research luxury items. In the early game, I'd suggest researching ritual accessories and building solemn pedestals, which add plus five luxury each at the cost of stone and ice petals. To my knowledge, the only impact that luxury has is to meet room requirements. A room with high luxury does not appear to do anything on its own. Keyword requirements for rooms are semi-random, though this can be changed in the settings. When you're starting out, I would suggest creating rooms in this order. Start with an austere bedroom. Place one or more cots in a room that meets the single keyword requirement, and your staff and students will enjoy, will enjoy a 2.5 conviction buff when sleeping in the room. Be sure that everyone has a cot. Sleeping on the ground gives a conviction debuff for everyone except for Wolfkin. The next room I would recommend is the workshop. Place your arcane secretary and wand shaper in this room and you'll gain a 25% research and production speed increase. This room also requires only one keyword. Later on, you can add the spindle to the workshop. The next rooms I would recommend are the dining room and mess hall. The dining room is for staff and requires one dining table and 10 luxury, along with a single keyword. The mess hall is for students and requires two or more dining tables and its keyword. Each provide plus five conviction. Staff eat in the dining room and students eat in the mess hall. When you build usable furniture, like the dining tables, everyone is allowed by default. Be sure to click the access tab and then disallow students from the dining room and disallow staff from the mess hall. The next room that I would recommend is the conservatory. Staff and students can both use this facility for a plus five conviction boost when recreating. 
Making this room can be difficult though because it has two keyword requirements and requires 25 or more luxury. I would suggest looking at the requirements on this room when you start the game and trying to meet, trying to get a room ready for when you do research a luxury item. I'm going to cover rooms in more depth in an upcoming video. Next, let's talk about research priorities. One quick note here, if you're playing on relaxed, you start with a few researches already unlocked. Chests, domestic gut berries, and rustic gourmet, which is cooking. Also, the research tree has a handy find box in the top top right, which allows you to search for specific buildings or research names. All right, so what order should you be researching? Here's my suggestion. Start with put stuff here, which is chests. It's on the far left-hand side of the research tree. Once this is researched, prioritize hauling. Newly hired students can haul without any training. My suggestion is to summon two or three students and have them haul all your stuff while your staff continues to gather resources. The next research that I would go for requires the chest research, and that is going to be dancing the night away. This will unlock the Enchantaphone, which is your main source of recreation. Get this as fast as you can and place it anywhere in your base, and move it to the conservatory as soon as you're able to get 25 luxury. All your units are going to start with zero recreation, so it's really important to get the Enchantaphone as fast as you can. The next research that I would go for is domesticated gut berries. This research provides renewable food. Gut berries aren't very appetizing though, so your units will get a temporary minus 15 debuff for eating them raw, except for the vivified who don't mind eating anything. Minus 15 is a lot better than starving, which gives a whopping minus 75 debuff. From here, there's two sets of research that you can go with. Both of them are going to get you plus 5 conviction. I prefer to go the cooking path first, but the ritual path is about the same amount of work and benefit. For cooking, research Rustic Gourmet. Raw gut berries give a minus 15 conviction debuff, but cooking them into gut berry soup gives a minus 10 debuff. I have mixed feelings about this recipe. On one hand, gut berry soup is better for conviction. On the other hand, the opportunity cost of having someone cook this food versus doing other tasks is off-putting. Additionally, cooking creates mess, which makes even more work for you to do. I typically wait to cook until I unlock the next research, which is Rustic Dining. This research is loaded. It unlocks bitter rice and bitter gruel. Farm the bitter rice and cook it into bitter gruel for a minus 5 conviction. Much better than the minus 10 from gut berry soup and the minus 15 from raw gut berries. Additionally, this research unlocks dining tables, which you should use to make the dining room and mess hall for a plus 5 conviction boost when eating. The dining room does require 10 luxury. The ritual research path does unlock a luxury building. Start with the basic rituals, which unlocks the ritual sigil. The ritual sigil is required to graduate students and to promote students to staff. This is also a requirement for the next research, which is ritual accessories. This research provides the solemn pedestal, which has a plus five luxury and is the earliest form of luxury available. When you finish this research, I suggest building enough solemn pedestals in a room that meets the conservatory keyword requirements. Place two enchantaphones in there, and you'll now have a conservatory which gives plus five conviction to staff and students when they recreate. Be sure to also place luxury items in the dining room so that your staff can enjoy the plus five conviction buff from eating there. With those researches complete, your base is essentially self-sustaining, and the next steps in your research journey are totally up to you. Let's get to some general gameplay tips that might help you in your first colony. First off, don't feel bad about promoting a bad student just because you need a specific element for a task. You can always retire them later and still get the scrolls. I've hired students that didn't complete a single trial only to retire them a few days later. Pay attention to random events, which can impact the environment and or combat. For example, when this event occurs, the high stink arises, the best option might be to disallow eating gut berries and gut berry soup in favor of other foods. The wand tier of each unit affects their conviction levels. Level 1 wands provide a small buff, while level 2 wands provide a small debuff, and level 3 wands a large debuff. Don't rush to the next wand tier until you have rooms in place to accommodate these conviction debuffs. Dying is not the end of the line for your mages. There are special graves that can be unlocked through research, and these graves provide rare resources like smoke pearl and hollow lily. Later on down the line, corpses can turn into ghosts that give staff a conviction buff and students a learning buff. Use your best staff to push back the fog, and use superior repel fog when you have the resources. Superior repel fog 
takes three times the resources as the default repel fog, but it pushes it back a lot further. Also, every time you push back the fog, the research cost is dependent on where the fog is. So if the fog is really close to your base, it's only going to cost wood and gut berries. Once the fog gets pushed out further, it's going to cost rarer and rarer resource resources. There are three overlays that I haven't gone over yet. Lighting, which is F2, filth, F3, and clutter, F4. Lighting shows how well lit rooms are. Any rooms that are not at least 50% lit through torches or other lighting will spawn void shrooms at a certain rate. Void shrooms are bad because they will drain your units of mana and give them a debuff. Filth is caused by cooking and a filthy room will spawn an ooze every so often. Be sure to have cleaners that are cleaning up after your, your chefs. Rooms are considered cluttered when they have items on the ground, making chests very important. A cluttered room will spawn a gremlin every so often, which will destroy items on the ground and items in rooms. That's all the tips I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed making it, and I'm really enjoying the game Mind Over Magic so far. This is the first time I've ever created any content or like even like done any video editing, so I hope it was good enough. I, I think that I'll definitely get better. I've learned so much as I've gone so far. Um, I can already tell I need like a better microphone if I'm going to keep doing this. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something and I hope you're loving the game too. Have a great day. Bye.